Uh, is there anybody over there? Nobody. All right. Well, I'm gonna look for Joe then. All right, thanks, right. Rosie. Yeah. Were you over there at Junior Johnson, sir? Oh, he's not sporting though, huh? Okay, no. well, I'll check him out.
steady, stay. So, uh, yeah, the first thing we need is uh, your name and, and how you spell it. Mm -hmm. My name is Oscar Kowchuk. Uh, Kowchuk is spelled K-O-U-T-C-H-A-K. And uh, how would you describe yourself uh, and what you do in town here? Are you like a, an elder of the town? Or? Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the elders. I. I'm going on 76 years old, and uh, I lived here most of my life. I spent a few years out of town, like no more Kotzebue or Tanana, and I went to a trade school down at FAA, uh, Oklahoma Academy. Uh, other than, than that, I spent my life in Alaska. Okay. and. I think my battery is dying. <laughs> okay, here we go. Fresh hey. battery. What's your first name again? Jeremy. Jeremy. Yeah. All right, so you're saying uh, you were born here and you spent most of your life here. Yeah. Um, I was born here back in 1930. And uh, I spent most of my life, my grown up years here in Unilakrit. Till I got married, and then from there I start. Uh, wherever jobs were open, I I go to work, try to find work here and there. Uh, I'd like to do a little history on 
on unity of my time. I was born 1930, October 27th, and I went to school here under their under BIA, which is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, for that matter, it was uh, BIA was all over Alaska, northern Alaska, among the uh, minorities like the Indians and the Eskimos and the Aleuts. Uh, our livelihood here has been changed dramatically over all these years that we lived anywhere we are, like like up the Yukon or up Point Barrow or in Yenlaklik or the Aleutians, for that matter. First of all, I'd like to say a little bit, little bit on the history of uh, Yenlaklik. Uh, back in 18... Uh, the sources I got was from uh, Aaron Cronwell. He's one of the, uh, uh, how should I say it? He's one of the directors of the Arctic Studies from Anchorage. Uh, Smithsonian Institute is run. I'm sorry, I got to interrupt you. I, the microphone cord got on your leg there. Oh. Maybe you can just kind of. That's good, right there. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so the uh, Smithsonian. Yeah, the history of Yenlikli is uh, dated way back uh, in the early days of 1865. I was uh, told by Aaron Cronwell of Arctic Studies that the Russians were here trading with the Eskimos. I don't know how they did it, but they took away a lot of these artifacts and then shipped them down to Washington D.C. Uh, the thing I'd like to talk about at first, uh, about that, then I'll go on to the, uh, how we were oriented to, you know, with the first missionary that came here in, to Yenlake back in 1865. Uh, no, no. Uh, you erased that. Uh, the first first missionaries came here back in 18, 1898. That was actually Carlson. He came from Chicago area and was was the first missionary to come to Unalakleet. According to my brother-in-law Stan Kajtag, that he, when actually Carlson first came here, he was surrounded by the people and want to know what's he doing here. They all talked Eskimo at that time. And he was uh, he was saved by this one old, uh, one of our elders' name is uh, old man Sherlock. He invited them to be in his house to stay away, you know, because there were a lot of people going after the, after the missionary. He thought they might be, you know, putting them away for good. I don't know for what reason, but that's the only thing that uh, I learned about him. Uh, so there were people that, uh, Eskimo people? That Eskimo didn't, people, yeah, yeah. Like the yeah, 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 yeah. He walked over from St. Michael. Uh, them days, uh, after the turn of the century, after that big uh, gold rush up to, uh, to northern Canada, they all come down after that big strike they did at Nome. So uh, all the all the uh, schooners were anchored out, possibly outside of St. Michael, because that's the deepest port closest to the mouth of the U to the Yukon River. In order to go up there with the stern wheelers. Now, uh, uh, this missionary, uh, actually Carlson, he I believe he built this our present church, it was built back in 1901. Uh, in fact, that old church is still standing by, standing near the corner over at the other end of this town. He introduced uh, uh, mission, uh, mission work, well, Christianity to Unalakleet. And uh, that's how everything started with the evangel evangelical church out of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, 
in the, them days, things were kind of tough to be living, uh, you know, along with the Russians, I believe, before this, this became the... Uh, Basically, you know, uh, Alaska was bought by 1867. Is am I right on that part? I'm not sure. You, you, you mean where you, the U.S. bought it from? Russia? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm not sure of the exact date. I think it was 18. I, I don't know when, but uh, they got it for <laughs> a couple of couple of dollars an acre or something like that. Anyway, you'll edit that thing over there. Oh, yeah. uh, in the early days, uh, Christianity was very they didn't know what was going on. So actually Carlson had to do, he had a translator, I believe, or it was Mr. Larson, I, one, of the, one of the two. And they introduced him to the Christianity back in 18, 1898. Then when, Mr., when, when uh, Reverend Carlson left Unilakleet, uh his his uh, the uh, there was another another i believe his name is anderson they stayed here in in the village of Unalheet and uh, uh run the church and the mission home what i mean by a mission home is a lot of there were a lot of uh young girls, you know, and boys where their their mothers are gone uh, on account of some kind of a uh, sickness that was going around or maybe a flu, I don't know. This was the, like, around 1918? Well, this one here I'll come back to uh, earlier. Uh, yeah, this, I don't know what, what really transpired around that, uh, around that time, because I was born way, way long time ago, uh, a lot later, 1930. Mm -hmm. But my recollection, my recollections from other people that there was a preacher named uh, Anderson, and he stayed here for a while, and it got transferred out to Law 48. Then he was... Uh, he was, uh, there was another gentleman that came from uh, Sweden. His name was Ernest B. Larson. He, uh, he kept the Yulke church going in a friendly manner. Uh, what I mean by that, you know, is, uh, you know, he was a real gentleman and he taught uh, villagers here in Yulke how to do, how to uh, plant gardens. And this was introduced by him. Uh, we didn't, I guess, the, the people them days uh, didn't. I was too small at that time to even, but I did a lot of work. I shoveled, me and my sisters, we shoveled the garden every year with a the, with the spade. We had no tiller of any kind, mechanical-wise. But uh, it... Uh, we yielded a lot of things to eat, like, you know, I, I can name a few. Uh, uh, we planted... I think I got that thing over there, man. Oh, it's, it's fine. You know, maybe just uh, after we're done here... Um, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, under E.B. Larson, now, uh, he introduced uh, how to run a garden, you know, like they do in Law 48. And out of what we learned, or they learned, they learned how to plant potatoes, cabbage, carrots, turnips, lettuce, cauliflower, rhubarb, radish, and etc. And uh, Mr. Larson also t taught him how to fertilize the gardens. Uh, them days, uh, the fish, uh, they still are, uh, the fish was abundant, and the uh, 
fish heads and whatever is left over from giant fish, they, we, we usually put it, we dig a hole in the garden and uh, put all the uh, fish guts and backbones, in the, you name it, we put them in, in there for fertilizer. And uh, they yielded better than they, that's the way they did it, I think. Also, uh, I'd like to go to the time when Sheldon Jackson, I don't know where he came from, but he introduced reindeer, I would say reindeer husbandry, is that is that the correct raising, raising? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, they brought the uh, reindeer, I don't know where they came from, maybe through Siberia or through New York or wherever. It's possible that they came over there from from uh, eastern, far east, where Siberia is today. Maybe Anadir or somewhere, I don't know. But they taught us how to plant and how to take care of it, and we water them every, every other day or whenever it's... It's when the sun shining, and we try to keep the things uh, in an order, orderly manner. Like if you plant your carrots or whatever, you have to thin, thin, thin out the uh, so they can grow bigger. Uh, potatoes, everything like that, uh, and celery, and that everything goes into the cellar at maybe a latter part of September when it's time to dig them out. And just about every home had a cellar with an air, I don't know, to have fresh air for the uh, for the potatoes. They didn't freeze at them days because it's dug in the ground underneath the living room or one room cabin. So it's easy accessible from the uh, middle of the room and just lift the door open and then this way we stored all the potatoes, all our vegetables. Mm. Uh, so you mean uh, even like in the summertime, you would have this, or they would have a, like a hole in the bottom of the room where they would, it would be cool? It's it cool, yeah, it's cool, it's cool down there where the, where the, uh, where the, where the uh, uh, cellar is. Mm. And my mother used to let us, uh, take the uh, head of cabbage and then hang them on the, on the floor joist underneath. And they'd keep all winter. In fact, all our old vegetables like potatoes, they keep up and my, to keep up with the, how uh, the hum humidity would, you know, would change at times, but uh, the airing of that, I believe that kind of, how would I say it, if, if you're not properly uh, uh, put ventilation in the uh, what you reaped, like potatoes, they'll keep growing. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but uh, that can be changed, you know, maybe when you edit this thing. Uh, so you mean uh, if if they would be, if air was like flowing past them, the potatoes would end up growing more, or like those little or, uh, deals that would come out the sides or something. Or? I don't know. Sprout. Yeah. yeah, they sprout. They sprout. Yeah, in, towards the spring, where it's warmer, they sprout every year. So then they wouldn't be edible after they would do that. Uh, no, we use that for planting. On um, every eye, we, my mother used to take a little with her ulo or a knife, and that's where it sprouted. That's where you take, she take a little piece, maybe biggest, or maybe like that, and then put them in a garden, you know, you know, then put them so on, so far. I don't know, maybe a foot apart, and they yield a lot of potatoes that way. And we take all the potatoes on, like I said, a lot of part of September, and it holds good. And it lasts all winter for everybody. Hmm. Uh, 
So uh, maybe uh, I could uh, just bring you back for a moment to uh, the like very beginnings of people living in this area, um, probably like before the Russians came here, before the missionaries and all that kind of stuff. There was people living right here, or were there? Or? Yeah, uh, the first one I ever, like the mound across the river, there were some Eskimos uh, living in the sod houses. There's another one over here that's uh, parallel with the run existing runway. And uh, there was another one, and this is the final place, according to our recollection uh, of how it started a long, long time ago. They had no, no white people around till, till the uh, missionaries came around. But uh, I think that thing is blink blinking now. Uh, yeah, it's uh, sending this loud tone right in my ears, too. It's, uh, the bat or the tape is almost done.